The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. It's a simple equation. More money, better quality. But is it true or applicable to things such as public services? Tonight, what would double the money in education actually accomplish? Then, a star of both Dragon's Den and Bay Street, Wes Hall, is here on his powerful new memoir, No Bootstraps When You're Barefoot. It's Monday, November 28th, and that's next on The Agenda. Somebody asked me the other day, if we spent twice as much money as we're spending today on our education system in Ontario, would our system be twice as good? An intriguing question, I thought. So let's get some answers. We've gathered four people who actually spend a lot of time thinking about whether more money is the answer. And with that, let's welcome, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Paul Bennett. He's director of the Schoolhouse Institute and author of The State of the System, a reality check on Canada schools. And here in our studio, Annie Kidder, Executive Director at People for Education. Mark Beckles, Vice President, Social Impact and Innovation at RBC. And Aisha Mahmoud, a grade 12 student at Ancaster High School in Hamilton, who's President of the Executive Council of the Ontario Student Trustees Association. And just before we dive in here, in the interest of full disclosure, let's remind everybody that TVO is a provider of the Ministry of Education's Distance and Online Learning, not the agenda, the program you're watching right now, the journalism side, we've got nothing to do with that, but the ILC, the Independent Learning Centre, which has been a distance learning partner with the ministry for almost 100 years. So we put that on the table in the interest of full disclosure and say welcome to everybody here in the studio. Paul, it's good to have you on the line from Halifax. Let's dive into this. You've heard the premise of the show, Annie. The government, let's say, in a magical world, the government decided it was going to spend twice as much money on education tomorrow as they're spending today. Would our system necessarily be twice as good? No. There. We're done. Um, no, I think that, I, I think it's been one of, and I've been doing this for a very long time now, so one of the problems, I think, for the last 25 years has been so much of the conversation has been about money and not about purpose, what we're doing, why we're doing it, what we need to change or kind of reimagine going forward. And I think it, it, we even forget um, that there are kind of two fundamental roles for public education, one for the individuals in it, but one for all of us as a society. And that's what we have to talk about first, before, way before we talk about money. All right, having said that, Mark, we spend $32 billion a year on education in the province of Ontario. If tomorrow we made it $64 billion, in your view, would we be twice as good? I'm with Annie on this. <laughs> I think that we need to be more strategic around how we invest and we need to prioritize how we not only educate students, but also how we educate educators. I think um, when I think of the, the learning centers that TVO provides, I think that lifelong learning should be a part of everyone's uh, uh, learning journey. And when we think about uh, educators in particular, uh, those who are, are on the offensive in terms of preparing young people and their fertile minds for the future of work and um, really enabling the prosperity of this country, what we need to think about is how do we better prepare educators to ensure that youth are better prepared for the world of work. Hmm. Okay, Paul Bennett, if we went from 32 billion to 64 billion, would we be twice as good? No, I think the answer would be that doubling spending is not the answer because it begs the question on what, over what period of time, and what are the priorities? And what we've learned, those of us that study education, is that if you pour money into the system, it doesn't necessarily end up going where it's going to do the most good. And I think you'd be surprised at how little would actually reach the classroom. Hmm. Aisha, are you going to make it unanimous or are you <laughs> going to go your own way here? Um, I have to say that I actually, on a more optimistic note, I think that if we spent twice as much money, there's an opportunity for our education system to be even more than twice as good. Um, like Annie was mentioning, I think it's about um, being really uh, uh, intentional about where we're spending that money. Obviously, I would say listening to students is a big part of that um, and understanding that putting money into the issue might not address some of the 
deeper problems that exist. Um, but at the same time, there are a lot of areas in our education system that would really benefit from additional funding. And with the right kind of strategy and consultation around, I think we could even aim higher than twice as good. All right, well, you say we have to listen to students. That's one of the reasons we invited you here today, because we do want to do that. But of course, the question presupposes that if you got a system that would be twice as good if you spent twice as much, that means we're spending intelligently, smartly on everything that we're spending on today, which is clearly not the case. So let's break it down. Annie, what are we spending on today that we're spending intelligently on, and therefore we probably ought to be doing more of that going forward? Well, the vast majority of money in education is spent on educators. It's spent on people because that's what education is. It's a relationship between staff and students, students and each other. So that's where the money goes and that's where it should go. You mean salaries, basically. It's, it's spent on salaries and that is, that is right. Um, but I think that it's thinking about um, it's thinking about policy first. So going, okay, where do we need more educators or more other different kinds of staff? Where do we need to rethink maybe if we're talking about education kind of globally, uh, the education of staff or providing, you know, do we have enough time for professional development or to rearrange schools? So the money is spent on staff. But I think that what we haven't done for a very, very, very long time is really look at it from a kind of wider perspective in terms of, uh, you know, it really all the things, pe the cliches people say about education, sadly, are kind of, it does look the same as it's looked for 150 years. Uh, and the world is vastly, vastly different. And I think to Aisha's point, when I, I work with the students trustees a lot, if we lis listen to students more, really, and not in a tokenistic way, but actually had them at the center of these conversations, we would be thinking about where do we need to expand programs, where do we need to shift how we're allocating staff or where we need more, how are we ensuring that we have, you know, kind of equitable outcomes uh, in our schools, which we still don't. We still talk about moving the equity needle and it hasn't really moved. So it's looking at those deep things, but also, you know, in, in Mark's work, looking at the future and going, and it's not that, and looking at what we mean by skills gaps, because we, we should be preparing kids for life in all sorts of ways, and we're not doing that as well as we could be. Let me pursue that last mm -hmm. angle there with mm -hmm. Mark, and that is that it, we are spending a great deal of money every year on education in Ontario. Mm -hmm. We seem to be spending it, apropos of what Annie said, on a model that's 150 years old. How should we better be or more smartly be spending that money so it's more future looking as opposed to, you know, putting it down a hole that's been there for 155 years already? Great question. All the data tells us that Canada's educational institutions are among the best in the world. Mm -hmm. And that is true. But it is interesting then that data also tells us that we are falling behind our G7 uh, partners in terms of economic output, economic growth, and so on. So it begs the question, why is that happening? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the reasons that is happening is because we have not reimagined our education system for 100 years. Globally, we need to be focusing on a skills economy. We need to be focusing on skills mobility, making sure that young people understand where the opportunities for the future are and ensuring that educators also know where those opportunities for the future are. We talk, for example, about professional development days for teachers. Mm -hmm. One idea that we've been talking about for the longest while is around how can we create co-op placements for educators? So one or two of those professional development days, an educator gets to spend time in the world of work. Outside of the school setting, no. they can come into the world of work. They're working, don't get me wrong. I'm not in any way sort of um, knocking what no, teachers do. No, no, but that's do. what I mean. They're yes. already in the world of work, yes. so where would you want to see them placed? I would love to see um, teachers come to Bay Street, for example, or to go into industry, or to go into some other uh, sector where they can understand what is happening beyond education, and to begin to make those connections between uh, Here's what we are focusing on in the classroom. Here's what we perhaps could be focusing on. But, but again, that's a policy situation. That's a policy issue. And so I think that um, I think the whole thing needs to be rethought and reworked within the context of how do you better equip educators 
for the future so that students get the best out of educators. Paul, can I get you on that? Reimagining the way the system works, how would you do that? I don't think it's the right question to ask. And uh, you asked what was good value for money, and we got a presentation which made the case for 21st century learning and uh, international uh, globalization, which is not really the answer to the question. Going back to the question you asked, if you really want an answer, we should be putting our value into, uh, we should be investing in initiatives and programs that target real problems and inequities and make sure that every one of those initiatives is tied to some kind of assessment of its effectiveness. I differ from the panelists so far. I, I think we're missing the priorities. The priorities should be raising educational standards to help everyone, whatever their position, closing the equity gap for racialized and marginalized and disadvantaged students. Well, and no one third, disagrees with that. Should be, we should be research oriented and assess everything that we're doing to see whether it works instead of just buying into the latest thing that comes flying by through global education. Okay, it's on. Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> well, I think for one thing, well, I think one of the things that's hilarious about 20th, 21st century skills is really they're the same skills as the Greeks talked about. They're actually human skills. They're actually the skills you need to keep on learning, to collaborate, to understand conflict, uh, to be able to take what you learned in one area and apply it to another. They're, they are the skills we need now because Aisha's going to have a million different jobs. She's going to need to keep on learning. She doesn't really need to learn to code because by the time she gets into a job, Nobody will need to know. Machines will be coding too. But everybody needs to be able to, and to have an open mind, and to understand how to have conflict and disputes. Like there are a lot of big, huge, important human skills, which we sort of tokenistically talk about in the education system. And I really agree, reimagining is what it's about. We do, compared to a lot of the rest of the world, have very strong public education in Canada and in Ontario. But it's a matter of not saying we're gonna add a whole bunch of other stuff on top of the curriculum. It's that we have to break the curriculum over open. We do have to, there are things we need to rethink, um, but they are, they, I think that is where we need to go. Absolutely, we need to assess it. Um, there's no question about that, but we can't just be assessing, you know, how's everybody doing in grade 11? We have to understand the law. The, the, we should be assessing 10 years out. And one of the problems I think right now, and that's why I'm happy Mark is here, is that often we talk about, you know, this is the world we're in, let's look at post-secondary, let's look at education um, when kids are already grown ups. And to me, it's like, it's too late then. We have to be starting, going way farther upstream, starting with early childhood. Well, let me try this with you, Aisha. You go to school in grade 12 in Ancaster, Ancaster High. Mm -hmm. When you walk into your classroom, do you think to yourself, my goodness, we're sort of doing this the same way they did it 150 years ago. We're on an agricultural cycle here, meaning everybody gets yeah. the summer off. We do need to reimagine education for the 21st century. Does that actually come into your head? Well, I would say that kind of coming from a perspective where I'm always thinking about, you know, representing students and um, bringing their voice to the table into these kinds of conversations. I think the more I've started to question why we do certain things or why we accept things as the way they are a status quo um, has kind of shown me more and more like to what Annie said, why we need to do a full kind of upheaval or reassessment of why our education system is structured the way that it is. <laughs> and even starting with that base level of like, are we instilling a love of learning in students from a young age? What's the answer to that? I don't think so. You're not, it really? Yeah. I okay. don't think so. And I think that's, that's a huge gap that we're having and it's, it's, perpetuating these achievement gaps that we've already been talking about because as far as the education system goes, students kind of need to meet it halfway and are we giving them the opportunity to kind of find that within themselves to, to love what they're learning, to love coming to school and to explore what they're passionate about and have the opportunities to explore what they're interested in and what they want to do in the future. So I think even kind of narrowing down our focus onto like within the walls of the school, are we setting students up for success and to, to love learning and to love coming to school um, and to kind of maybe question why we do certain things instead of accepting them as they are, uh, which is definitely a big undertaking, whether that's locally or um, provincially or even federally. But I think that's kind of 
where it starts, if we're looking at funding, maybe we need to actually kind of dig a little bit deeper into why do we spend money where we do and okay. how we spend it. Let me put that to Mark. Do, mm -hmm. Would it cost more to get what, where Aisha wants to go, namely to encourage that love of learning from an earlier age in the education system? I don't think it needs to cost more. Mm -hmm. I think we need to assess where we're spending money today and to determine whether, in fact, we need to redeploy some of those, uh, some of those investments so that uh, the Aishas of this world, the next generation, uh, really are able to get the best uh, of the education system. But I'll go back to Paul's comment uh, just for a little bit because, uh, you know, I happen to think that, you know, some of what Paul talked about, um, I think the system's already doing. I mean, they're already assessing what's working and what's not working. They're looking at equity and, and a whole range of different things. But I, but I wonder whether we're not, I wonder whether we're spending too much time assessing an antiquated system as opposed to challenging yeah. ourselves to think yeah. about yeah. what a new, more modern, more purposeful, more intentional education system could look like. One that is intentionally inclusive, one that is designed with students in mind, one that prioritizes learning and education for educators as opposed to spending time and effort coming back to the same thing that we keep talking about after every, every assessment, every commission of inquiry, every single, to say, the system's broken. We know it's broken. Let's focus on something else. Let me get Paul to comment on that. What do you think, Paul? Is he onto something there? Um, the love of learning is an interesting phrase. Anyone that's read my book, The State of the System, will know that I've done an analysis of how many times that's been advocated 1968, the Hall-Dennis Report, uh, Love of Learning, uh, the Royal Commission uh, on Ontario Education in 1995. It has its major focus. It was even called for the love of learning. So I think what our panelists are saying is we've had a lot of people say that's what they were doing, but down when it comes to students and uh, teachers, they haven't really found that that's been carried out. So my question is, how much faith do we have in those that are bringing in reforms and talking in these general terms when it doesn't happen. I, let me get specific. If kids can't read, which is the problem in Ontario, is that not a 21st century skill? If the Ontario Human Rights Commission finds that we've got one third of all students who can't read, how, how can they engage in the school system? Is that part of the 21st century skills or does it somehow disappear? What research shows is that 90% of students should be able to read at the end of grade three, but that's not the case. When you have an Ontario Human Rights Commission that's saying there's a, a crisis, why isn't that registering? That's a good question. What's the answer, Annie? Why isn't well, it registered? Well, I think, you know, there's statistics and statistics. So yeah. they're not, you know, kids are not getting B in reading. So there definitely are. I'm not going to, you know, there are issues we need to focus on. But if we keep only measuring reading, writing, and math, or keep only focusing on reading, writing, and math, which we still call the basics, and we, at People for Education, we've been talking about the new basics for a long time, we we won't move forward. We will not ensure that, that we have the love of reading to, to Paul's point, but also uh, that kids have all the other sort of breadth of skills they need. So what we're arguing in our organization, and we have just launched what we're calling the big assignment, because we're, and we think of it as a big assignment for all of us, then not just for people inside education. I think educators are amazing. I think the people who know about education are amazing, but I think that one of the, one of the sticking points we have right now is that conversations about education happen so kind of internally. They happen in a kind of close closed loop, and that we're not recognizing how important it is, whether you have kids in school or not, or you're in the system or not, how important it is to all of us in terms of having a fair, prosperous, democratic society. So for us, that conversation has to expand. We have to talk about where we want to be as a country, and then if that's where we want to be as a country, what do we need to be doing differently in our schools? All right, let me pick up on that. Paul, we, we, we asked a moment ago about what we're spending money on, that is intelligent spending, and therefore we want to do more of that. Let me ask you the flip side of that is, which is, what are we spending money on that's stupid right now and we really shouldn't be spending? We're, we're throwing money away by spending it on this and we should stop doing it. Whenever you hear the phrase, we're investing in education, you should bring a skeptical eye. Because when it, it's not uh, tied to targeting or evaluating the effectiveness of programs, all it does is balloon public spending, actually fatten the compensation lines, 
and it doesn't. So um, what is not good value? Well, I'll repeat the things that research shows. I'm the chair of Research Ed Canada. I'll just give you the research. Reducing class sizes, while it's popular from grade three to grade eight, has a negligible effect. John Hattie and other researchers have shown that. Inclusive education is one of these fields that is so difficult to evaluate. Um, integrating all students into the regular classrooms is likely unaffordable, but we do need to think about how we serve those that are most in need. And thirdly, I think, and Mark's not going to like this, but if we assess what has happened to money that's been invested in technology, as I have, you're going to find that the promise far exceeds the delivery. If you believe the tech um, giants, and um, that's where most of the money goes, they, they really thought that we would be in 21st century learning was actually 20th century learning. Some of us have been around long enough to know that we were told that we needed to embrace 20th century learning. Um, what is the result of what is being proposed for these job skills of the future? Uh, too much of it is, uh, is you know, automated jobs, um, displacement of workers, McJobs, and a precarious economy. I, I, it's hard to find uh, hope there. Um, so I hope there's more to it than uh, that kind of an economy. Let me go back to Mark then. We're spending $32 billion a year on education. Mm -hmm. What part of that do you think we're spending stupidly and on what? I would say, uh, again, back to my, my original point, that I think that we need to, we need to equip uh, educators to really have a good understanding of where the future of work is. And where Paul and I agree, where Annie and I agree, and Aisha and I agree, is this whole notion of really focusing on the kinds of skills that enable skills mobility, which is to say that we don't need to focus so heavily on technical skills as much as we need to focus on human skills, whether it be communications, what to Paul's point, we need to in ensure that uh, there's a, a minimum level of literacy and ability to read, critical thinking, creativity, what we call the power C skills. Once we can equip young people with those skills, we actually now begin to create a, a, a workforce that is increasingly more mobile and more adaptable so that as the world of work changes, um, it is not then about a 21st century workforce. It is about an adaptable, mobile mm. workforce that, that, that moves as you know, the world of work uh, uh, changes. We published in 2018, and you may be aware of this, uh, Steve, a groundbreaking research uh, paper uh, titled Humans Wanted, How uh, Young People Can Thrive in an Era of Disruption. And we, we, we have to acknowledge that technology has and will continue to disrupt the way in which we live and work, that there are jobs that exist today that are going to disappear quite fast. Well, what are young people supposed to do? The only way they can port to other types of careers is to ensure that they've got the requisite skills that enable that skills mobility. And I agree with Paul uh, that the tech industry oftentimes overpromises and some would argue under delivers, but that is the nature of innovation. Innovation often comes at a cost. But I will say this, I think ultimately what we need to figure out is what is Canada's moonshot? Where does Canada want to be uh, in five years, in 10 years, in, in, in 50 years? Measured how? Measured in terms of how we as a nation um, uh, unleash our talent on the world, hmm. uh, measured in terms of how we are seen among our global partners, measured in terms of the extent to which everyone feels like they, had a, they have a fair shot at opportunity, measured as are we, am I able to contribute in the way that I want to and to deliver value to and this country. Can I add to that? Because I think it's also important. I think that all those things are important too, but that in terms of that moonshot and where we want Canada to be, to be I think we also want a population that has a sense of agency, uh, that has a f feeling of kind of belonging, that isn't quite so polarized, where we have a population that understands uh, the difference between misinformation and actual evidence. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we just saw, you know, a lot of people getting very cross about uh, whatever 
paper, you know, things to do with the pandemic and thinking they could go and take over the government. And you go, actually, maybe you needed to have learned more about how the government works. So we, w that, I think that there, there's a whole basket of things that, that we want for our country, and there's a huge role for education in that. Can I, I wonder if when you go to school, you look around, and do you ever say to yourself, why the heck are we spending money on this? This doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> do you have those moments? Um, I'm, to be honest, I have more moments of, I wish we were spending more money on this. I think it's really valuable. I, I'm not sure if there are any, um, any, anything that I see in my school, like within the walls of my school that I see that I think um, isn't valuable. But at the same time, I do think that it's um, kind of frustrating when we see things like funding that's kind of leaving the public education system and maybe going to families or parents or things like that um, when that kind of exacerbates these gaps that already exist. For example, um, addressing kind of learning loss over the pandemic. I think that there's a way to do that where we're offering academic resources and support to students within their school because that's their community hub um, instead of, you know, giving that money to parents, for example. Um, that's the approach to the current government. Yeah, workout. which I think for students is kind of frustrating because our schools already exist um, as a place for us to access these resources and a lot of students don't have the same access um, to resources outside of school. So when that money kind of leaves the education system instead of being more centralized, I think that's where um, myself and you know my friends and my peers get a little bit frustrated. And it's like, we, we could be seeing this in our school building instead. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. I, we're, uh, time has flown here. We're down to our last few minutes, and I want to, uh, Paul, I'm going to put a nice provocative question to you here. One of my hockey buddies asked me the other day, uh, apropos of the confrontation over the last few weeks between CUPE here in Ontario and the government of Ontario, would it bring more labor peace to the school system if, for example, we made this offer to teachers? We will double your salaries, but you have to leave the union. Do you think that would be better for peace in our system, Paul? You're going to create a revolution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, all it takes is a QP strike to turn the entire system on end. So I'm going to dodge the question and simply say this. I think there are much more effective ways at, of getting improvements in the school system. That is like thick focus on realities, the things that are really there. And one of them is, and I think teachers would agree with this, Far too much money goes into administration. There are layers of administration. I think most teachers agree with this, that uh, it's simply not acceptable that most educators don't even appear in the classroom. And that is one of the reasons we need to assess how the resources are being distributed. And you know, for Aisha, uh, she's in a school, how many administrators are there? How many people working in that school actually don't teach kids face-to-face -face on a day-to-day -day basis. We know it might be 50%. We also know that so much of our resources are going into human resource costs that it doesn't really reach the classroom where Asia and students are every day. I'm not really prepared to let this question go. Andy, I'm putting you on the spot here. If we offered to double teacher salaries, but we said to them, you can't belong to a union anymore, is that a bargain that we should try to aim for because it would bring more peace to the school system? I, I actually can't imagine why that would be, and even the why of the either or. Mm -hmm. I think teachers and all of the staff that work in schools, mm -hmm. whether or not they're in their classroom or not, they have an impact on students, should be paid more. I think it's an incredible job. I think we should be looking at other countries where it's the most sought after job, which it isn't in Canada right now. So, But I don't think making equating this with being in or outside of a union is necessarily the point. It has been bumpy, absolutely, but it is a it is a vital job. And I just want to argue with another thing that Paul said about investment. <laughs> Actually, investing in education does pay off. So right now, everything looks really shaky, stock markets, everything else, but the investment we make as a society in education pays off for sure. That's been shown by economists, by the conference board, by everybody. So it's a good investment. Do you know what? This Not very morning, morning, not every dollar for sure, but no. this very morning, the uh, Public School Boards Association Mm -hmm. OPSBA had a news conference in which they unveiled some new uh, data from Nanos Research. Apparently 90% of people in Ontario believe public education is an investment in the future, is a strong positive investment in the future. That's a pretty good number, Yeah, 90%. It's excellent and that's really great and it's backed up 
in every way possible that and we but it's hard you know politically because mm -hmm. we like money that you know gets us our return instantly there was a wonderful chair sorry to go on of the Toronto District School Board who once said the problem with children is they take an unconscionably long time to grow up and her point was we didn't see the our ROI our return on investment for 20 years but the return is huge if you had a billion dollars burning a hole in your pocket right now that you could spend on anything in education what would it be I go back to uh, educators. I would spend that money reimagining how we prepare educators to prepare uh, to prepare y uh, young people for the for the future. I think there is a lot of work to be done uh, in that context, and I'll use the word of the month. Notwithstanding, <laughs> notwithstanding Paul's point, I will then leverage uh, your your hockey analogy, and as Wayne Gretzky so eloquently said, "Be where the puck is going." Not where it's been. Not where it's been, yeah. where it's going. So I think we need to spend time understanding where the puck is going and to make sure that we mobilize to support these millions and millions of young people uh, who depend on the knowledge, the capabilities, the commitment and determination of arguably among the most important uh, uh, sector in our country yeah. are educators. They are the f they are they are the f they are the front row to everything. They are the offensive line to everything that we achieve as a country. We got a hockey and a football analogy. Wow. Yeah. Same so answer. That's <laughs> impressive. <laughs> Annie Kidder, Aisha Mahmoud. Thank you so much for coming in tonight. Mark Beckles on the other side of the table from RBC. Paul Bennett out of town in Halifax, Nova Scotia. It was great to have all of you on the agenda tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You probably know our next guest as one of the dragons on the CBC show Dragon's Den. What you may not know is that there is a remarkable story behind his current success on Bay Street, a story that starts with unimaginable poverty. He's told his story in a memoir entitled No Bootstraps When You're Barefoot, My Rise from a Jamaican Plantation Shack to the Boardrooms of Bay Street. And with that, we welcome Wes Hall to our studio. It's great to see you. Steve, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Tell me something. Do you, do you think I could uh, rock that pink suit as well as you? What do you think? Well, you know, there's only probably about two or three people in the world <laughs> that can do this. No kidding. And no if you're kidding. one of them, I want to join you, my friend. Uh, uh, let me give you a little secret. I'm not. Yeah. yeah, I'm really not. And at some point, Sheldon, you got to get a shot of these shoes because those are, um, well, yeah, I have not quite seen shoes like that before. And I think our viewers might want to see what they look like, and they look dangerous, Wes. That's all I can say is well, they look dangerous. Let's just say this. Don't get me upset when I'm wearing these shoes, <laughs> no okay? Kidding. No kidding. <laughs> I want to start telling your story here because it's shocking. It's shocking where you started compared mm -hmm. to where you have ended up now. So let's go back. Your mom is 28 years old. Yeah. She's got seven kids, and she abandons all of you. Yes. You're 18 months old. How did you do it? Well, that's the thing. When, when you're 18 months, I, I had no choice. You know, she just, uh, she boiled a pot of porridge and she left it. And she, my sister was four, uh, four years old. So she must have told her that, by the way, when the kids are hungry, feed them. And uh, my brother was six months old. So there we are, three of us in that house, the rest of the kids with my grandmother, and, uh, and she never came back. And uh, so as an 18 month old kid, I'm hungry. And so Ian and I started to cry like really loudly. And my sister Joan, again, only four years old, didn't know what to do because the, the, the pot was empty. And uh, a neighbor came by and heard the commotion, came in, walked to the threshold of the house because it's a one bedroom place, you can see what's inside. In Jamaica. In Jamaica, in rural Jamaica, and realized that these kids were by themselves in this place. Your father was not there? My father was not there. My father left when I was one to come to Canada. And uh, he was a 24 year old man and he'd go, I want to discover the world. And you know, Golden Grove, Jamaica wasn't big enough for me. He had ambitions of his own and he left so I was one year, year old, and I always st stayed with my mother. Your grandmother saved the day, though. My grandmother was uh, amazing. So when that man came, the man was going by on a bicycle and heard, and he stopped and, and came by, and he goes, okay, I'm gonna go get your grandmother. 
And uh, my grandmother came with my older sister, uh, Barbara, and a trolley and uh, load us up and took us to the plantation house that she was raising the rest of the kids, the mm. grandkids. Now, your mother would drop into your life from time to time yeah. in future years. Yeah. Why is it that your grandmother never read your mother the riot act about <laughs> taking care of her own children? My grandmother kind of did, but didn't. Because, um, so my grandmother would, uh, you know, she would say, listen, you need to take care of your own responsibility, right? So my mother would stop coming to see us. And so she didn't really want to go too hard on her because then she would just never come at all. And so she would, you know, you need to look after your kids, you need to, but then she would just pull back. And uh, so, but my, even with that, my mother would only show up literally to see us for like about 10 or 15 minutes. Until the day when she finally showed up and said, Wes, yeah. you're coming with me. You're anointed. You know, you are anointed to come to live with me. Now, what, what precipitated that? I didn't know at the time. I didn't know at the time, but... And you're how old when this happens? Eleven. So everybody was saying, take one of the girls. The boy will look after himself. He's going to work on the plantation. He's going to be fine. But your girls are going to get pregnant, and you need to protect them. So take one of the girls. And she wouldn't have any of it. She would go, nope, I want Wes. I want Wes. And I thought I won the lottery. You didn't, Wes. I did not win the lottery. Wes, she beat you. She humiliated you. She was a misery to you. Yeah. Why? Do you, did you ever get to the bottom of why? You know, I never understood it. And later on, I start to think, why would someone behave this way? Someone who should love you unconditionally, who actually hated you by the way they treated you. Hmm. And then I start to think about how much love she had for my father. My father was the one who got away. She had all these men that came into her life, impregnated her, and then they would leave. But my dad was this man that was special. He was athletic, he was young, he was good looking. And, I, and she had him, and all the girls in the neighborhood wanted that man. Hmm. And she had him, but he didn't want her. She cracked your head open once. She did. I still have the scar in the back of my head. Why didn't you run away after that? You know, it's funny because I, I ran away shortly before I, uh, uh, shortly before that happened. I literally couldn't take it anymore. And it's gotta be, I was about maybe 12 years old. And I ran away back to St. Thomas to, with my grandmother. And that was an experience. And it's almost like um, you, you know, you're held hostage and then you try to escape and then you're caught. Hmm. There are consequences when you try to escape and you get caught. Well, that's what happened because after I ran away, my, my mother came to get me and there were consequences <laughs> after. So there was, it, it was an unwritten rule after that that don't even try this again. Well, here's something she said to you. She looked at you and she said, you're black, you're ugly, and you're not mine. Now that is a terrible thing for any mother to say to anybody. For anyone to say to anybody at all. Right, right. <laughs> right. Do, do, I mean, have you forgiven your mother for all of this over the years? Oh, absolutely. It, you know, I, I have because there's no reason why you should harbor resentment. My grandmother taught me that. My grandmother wasn't resentful to any of her kids for leaving all their kids with her to look after on a plantation worker salary. She never a day was resentful, nor did she resent us as a result. So she was, uh, she epitomizes forgiveness. So to me, I wanted to be like her. And you really did it. And I did, I did. I wanted to, my grandmother had four children, all with the same man. And when that man became an alcoholic, she kicked him out of the house because she go, I don't want you to corrupt my kids, my grandkids. She kicked him out. He would show up every now and then and uh, hang out with us and so on, but she would have nothing to do with him at all. And she looked after those four kids on her own and then they became adults. But one of those kids was special needs, my aunt uh, Daphne. And she looked after her until the day she died at 97 years old. My grandmother died at 97. Amazing. She was committed. 
And so she wasn't promiscuous. She didn't abuse us. So I spent almost 11 years watching that behavior. And that informed the person that I would become later on in life. You figured out right from wrong by I watching I figured it out really quickly. I yeah. figured out how to behave. She never treated us poorly. She never let us feel as if we're a burden, you know, to her. Mm -hmm. But yet when I went to live with my mom, I was a burden. I was clearly a burden, but I couldn't understand why she would want to keep me around mm -hmm. until I found out later on it was my dad who was in Canada that she was pining for for all this time saying, where's Wes? Wes is still at the grandmother's. You need to go get him and he needs to be with you. Well, eventually, 1985, you do come to Canada to be with your father. Yeah. And to meet a bunch of siblings that you didn't really know at all. Didn't know. How did that transition go from Jamaica to Toronto? Well, it, it was interesting because when I was in Jamaica, I was, uh, my mom kicked me out of 13, so that's when all the abuse and the beating stopped, and it was the happiest day of my life, by the way, hmm. because even though I was only 13 years old and I, was, I didn't know where I was gonna live, I knew that I wouldn't be subjected to all the things that she was subjecting me to before, the physical and mental abuse that she was putting me through. And um, at 16, keep it living on your own, in 13 to 16, and then 16 years old, my dad goes, hey, I want you to come live with me. And uh, I thought I won the lottery for sure this time. <laughs> this time, this is the real lottery that I won. It's not a fake lottery like going to live with my mom. This was the deal because I get to go to Canada. It wasn't that I get to go to live with my dad this time. Before it was, I get to go live with my mother. This time, I get to go to Canada. And that was the golden ticket for me. This is 37 years ago now. This is 37 years and ago. And you show up with that accent. I did. What did people think of that? Well, everybody, I said, well, what can't understand him, I said. <laughs> they, they, they couldn't. So I went to, so September 27, 1985, I came here on a Friday. Hmm. And on Monday, I was in school. And as you know, when you go to school, before you get to your classes, you meet with a guidance counselor, and they pick your subjects for you. They put me in the ESL program, <laughs> English as a second language. And to be clear, it was your first language. It was my first language. But it, it sounded from different from everybody else. <laughs> it's, okay. it, it had a little accent on it that the guidance counselor goes, I don't know what this guy can, I can't understand this kid. <laughs> well, in fact, there's an expression you use in the book, and you'll say it better than I will, because I'd never heard it before. Bus me cock? Bus me cock. What is that? <laughs> so this is an instrument, a weapon that my dad had where if you, it's, it's made of uh, leather and it's usually salted and soaked to make it really firm and thick. And that's something that he uses to administer discipline when we're out of line. So he hit you as with children, it. yes, as, mm. as a young man, as a young man. And, uh, and the expression I think came from, well, if you think you're a man, I'm gonna use this to let you know that you're not a man anymore. And so the bus macaw is an ex is, is a thing that the Jamaican you know parents use to discipline their children, and it should be outlawed. Quite frankly, <laughs> it should be. Okay, you get a bunch of jobs uh, once you're done school, and you're in Toronto. You get a job at a chicken factory. Eventually, you move up to a mailroom at a law firm, which is a pretty good job. Steichman Elliott, yeah. one of the big law firms in town. Um, and at some point, somebody says you'll never become a clerk here at the law firm. Mm -hmm. What did you infer when they said that to you? I looked around the department and all I saw were women in the department. There were no guys in the department. So I figured they just don't hire men to be lockers in this company. The guys are lawyers because it's all mostly men were lawyers at the time mm -hmm. and women were law clerks. And so I got that as a message that you're not going to be a law clerk here because you're a man. So it actually, you didn't infer it's the color of my skin I that's a problem. I did not infer racism. Hmm. But here's, the, here's the, the difference in my case. And, and I didn't start to really put my finger on racism until way into my career. See, when I was in Jamaica, I saw black school teachers, black principals, black lawyers, black judges, black business people, everybody that are in powers of influence, the prime minister was black, the parliament members were black, everybody were black people for the most part. And so the only thing preventing me from being one of those people 
was poverty. My grandmother couldn't afford to send me to school to learn, to be educated, to become a lawyer, a judge, a politician. And when I came to Canada, that condition was cured. I no longer had that because education was free. I had the right to go to high school. And if I'm smart enough, I can get a scholarship to go to university. So to me, my color was never an obstacle, just my poverty was. So when someone sent the message to me that you're not gonna be here because, I, I filled in that because, because I'm a guy, <laughs> because I'm dressed too fancy. But that may not be what they meant. But that later on, looking back, you knew that the sign was very obvious because my brothers and sisters who were born here would know exactly what that meant mm -hmm. and would have gone, okay, I gotta leave this profession because I'm not gonna get anywhere. You continued to work your way up the food chain, five years at Can West, then you moved to CIBC Mellon. You're managing white guys who are twice as old as you are. How'd that go? That was, I remember my, uh, you know, one of the guys was managing in my mid twenties, you know, and uh, he was 55, he's, he's as old as I am now. <laughs> and I could see how it would take exception to that. This young kid, he's been with the company for 30 years and he now has to report to me. And so he had a problem with that. But then I put myself in his shoes. But he was just giving me the gears every single day. Every single day, he would pack up his bags and he would do it loudly so everybody would see early and would just walk out. And so I go, you know what? I need him more than he needs me. I had a job that I was really over my head. I didn't know how to do. And he's been doing that job for 30 years and I just started. So I'm gonna get him to be an ally. I have to befriend him. So him and I had a come to Jesus conversation <laughs> and I just allowed him to be the boss. So when he walked into a room, automatically clients would assume that he was the boss. He was a middle-aged white man with gray hair and I was a, a mid-twenties black guy. Automatically they would assume that he is the boss. So I gave them that impression and I took notes and he would run the meetings. And ultimately, he started to give me nuggets of knowledge. Wes, here's how you should behave in this situation. When he asked this question, here's how you should respond. And that's how I learned. You know, my ego didn't allow me to prevent myself from learning and moving ahead. Well, at one point, you came to the conclusion, and this is a quote from the book, being black is my superpower, yeah. you said. What did that mean? It means that in a lot of cases, people underestimate you because of the color of your skin, or me anyways, and they put their guards down. They don't bring their A game. They just go, he's uneducated, he's not as smart. All the different things that come into their minds when they think about what a black person can or can't do. And so I'm in an industry whereby if you underestimate somebody, it's just like in a ring with Mike Tyson. <laughs> you underestimate them, you're gonna be- You pay for it. You're gonna be on your back. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then you're gonna find out when they put smelling salt in front of you and you get up and you go, what just happened? Well, you had your hand behind your back and you were being cocky. But the and, fact that you managed to go from working in a chicken factory yeah. to, and I'm not even gonna get to where you are right now, but you moved up the food chain pretty quickly. You know, for, for a 20-something black kid from Jamaica, you did pretty well. To what do you attribute that success? You know, after writing the book and then reading it, I went, how, how did this happen? <laughs> how, this, how did this happen? Everybody goes, tell me, Wes, tell me, give me the secret to your success. I don't think I had any secrets other than the fact that I was able to exploit every single opportunity that was put in front of me. Every single one of them. And you were ambitious. I was ambitious, but think about, you know, when people say the chicken farm, right? I, you know, you work at a chicken farm. I can't believe that. Well, that opportunity could have led me to be the general manager of the chicken farm and potentially the CEO of the company if I'm smart enough. Right. If I'm smart enough and I'm ambitious enough. So it doesn't really matter where you start. So I started in the mailroom. And a lot of people would go, I would never start in a mailroom. But guess what? Look where it got me. So I was able to exploit every single opportunity presented to me when others would go, I would never do that. There is another line in your book, in your book where you say, I can tell you for a fact, black people know when it's about race. How do you know? So 
in, I'm driving my car. I have a Ferrari 458 Spider, and I'm driving to the office. I was dressed like this without a tie on, and somebody go, stop my car, handed me his business card, and go, I'm a criminal lawyer in the city of Toronto. Give me a call if you're looking for a lawyer. Is that about race? I drive that car to the Four Seasons to have lunch with a client. I get out and somebody hand me $20 to valet their car for them. Is that about race? I go to the, uh, I'm traveling, go to the airport, walk into the priority line, just before I hand in my boarding pass, you're in the wrong line, you need, you need to be in the economy line. Is that about race? So a lot of people have explanations to say, maybe it's because you were dressed this way, maybe it's because your car was too flashy, maybe, maybe, maybe. You forgot the best story. You're jogging in your neighborhood with your wife. <laughs> Tell that story. I'm jogging through my neighborhood and my, you know, uh, people would say, are you, could I use your personal trainer one day to my wife? They think and you're her personal trainer. They think I'm my wife's personal trainer. Or they come to my house and go, go get Mr. Hall for me. Or they ask me, are you the security guard? So, again, you can excuse those behavior every now and then, but all of a sudden, when they just keep on adding on and adding on and piling on and piling on, you go, it's got to be about race. I'm not that naive to think that people are that ignorant. In which case, you start something called Black North Initiative. Yeah. What's that? So after George Floyd was murdered, I wrote an article, and it was published in uh, one of the major newspapers. And it was on the front page. And it, uh, it was entitled, When I Look in the Mirror, I See George Floyd. Hmm. And in the article, I talked about me experiencing the effect that his murder had on me when I watched that video. And, uh, and I looked and I stood up. I was, everybody was working remotely at the time, virtually. I was in my home office and I stood up after watching the video and there's a mirror in front of me and I literally saw George Floyd looking back at me because what I saw was how I would have been treated had I been in that situation. Nobody would care if I live in one of the fancy neighborhoods in the city if I work on Bay Street, what my bank account balance was, they wouldn't have cared. All they saw was a black man because he was driving a Mercedes Benz and I had one in my driveway. And nobody asked him any questions. So, but I also start to recount my experiences as a black person. And I talk about me jogging through my neighborhood and a white woman fell in front of me and I hesitated to help her because was uh, scared about the potential consequences of me trying to help her. Mm -hmm. What if she was disoriented? Then she started fighting me off. My neighbors were all white because I'm the only black person in the neighborhood. And then all of a sudden the police shows up. We know the stats with respect to how police treat black people. And I have no identification because I was out jogging. I hesitated and I asked the question of my neighbors. How many of you in my position would see someone in need and hesitated because of the potential consequences to you? And so when I wrote that article, I started to get a lot of inbound calls from a lot of corporate leaders saying, Wes, I didn't get it. How can I help you? And at the end of the day, I go, let's start this organization called the Canadian Council of Business Leaders Against Anti-Black Systemic Racism. Mm -hmm. It's a mouthful, let's call it the Black North Initiative. Mm -hmm. And because we're all CEOs, let's agree that we're gonna change the, the, the conversation within our own companies. And we're gonna start at the C-suite level, the board level, the C-suite level, the pipeline, and all aspect, we're gonna look around and go, are there black people here? And if there aren't, why not? And what are we gonna do about it? Well, this must happen to you all the time. You walk into a board meeting, you're the only black face in the room. Am I yes, right? Yes, it, it, is, it is very common. <clears throat> and it's still common, is common today. And, uh, but I also know that there are a ton of very smart, capable black people in this country. I meet a lot of them. And a lot of them tell me that they just can't get the breaks. They just can't get it. See, I was pretty fortunate when I came here because I was able to meet, you remember I talk about exploiting every single opportunity, but you have to meet the right people to be able to exploit those opportunities. I could have been just like that person in the mail that in, in saying you'll never be a law clerk in this, in this company. Well, that's the wrong person. But then when I got the job at Can West, I met the right person. And that right person was able to say, I don't really care what you look like. You're smart, you're gonna get the break. And so I was able to maneuver my way throughout the system to meet some wrong people, put that aside, find the right person, embrace them, embrace what they're teaching me, and then use that to get to the next level. There are going to be people who will listen to your story, may read the book, and they will say, 
look where he started, look where he is now. He's a, you know, titan on Bay Street. He's got a great TV show. This story proves that Canada is not a racist country because otherwise he'd never been able to achieve what he achieved. Is that the wrong conclusion? It is because I would say point to another. <laughs> you are pretty unique, aren't you? <laughs> it's like, there's not too many. And, uh, and, and so if, if it doesn't exist, there should be so many more uh, of me out there. Do you feel like a unicorn? Uh, in some circles, in some circles. But I also feel that I have a privilege when I'm in those uh, positions of being a unicorn to now educate the people who are gracious enough to allow me in the room to let them know why other people like me should be in the room as well. Hmm. Let's finish up on this. Black North Initiative. The idea is out there. You've asked corporate, you've asked political people for support to get it going. Mm -hmm. Put some oomph into it. How's it going? It's going amazing. Um, when you look at corporate Canada today, the face of corporate Canada is very different than it was in 2020. Mm -hmm. Two short years. Two short years. Just look at the boards, look at the C-suite, Look at the universities, the kids graduate and the kids get in jobs, very different. However, there are some out there who believe that we haven't done enough because their expectation is that after 400 years of oppression, that it should be solved in two years by this organization, Black North. Right. That's an offense to all the black people who fought so hard, Martin Luther King Jr. and others, who fought so hard to advance the ball that we're gonna start this organization, Black North, and racism is gonna be eradicated in Canada for good in two years. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna show the cover of this book because that little six, seven-year-old kid from Jamaica is now worth how much? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit more than that. <laughs> a little bit more than it was worth back then. I can't thank you enough for coming in here and telling your story. The book is a great read. Uh, you, you are astonishing. Well, Steve, thank you. Uh, clean and simple. Mm -hmm. uh, no bootstraps when you're barefoot. Wes Hall. Thank you so much, Wes. Steve, thanks for having me. And that is the agenda for Monday, November 28th, 2022. Tomorrow, why everyone in Ontario should be paying attention to the expanding strong mayor powers in this province. And one more thing, we wanted to close out tonight's program by noting the passing of one of our favorite people here at TVO. Over the past two and a half decades, when we needed someone to explain complicated business or economic stories in a way everyone could understand them, we called on Brian Milner. Brian just had a delightful way of doing his thing, both in the pages of the Globe and Mail and on this program. Brian died of complications after surgery. We send our deepest sympathies to his wife, Sylvie, and his daughter, Katrina. Brian was 74 years old. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow.